Thank you for taking the time to watch this sixth video review of the James White Thomas Ross debate, the Legacy Standard Bible as a representative of modern English translations based upon the United Bible Society's Nassau Allen text, is superior to the King James Version as a representative of text receptus based Bible translations, a proposition, of course, which James White affirmed and which I denied. In the last several videos, we have been examining James White's astonishing claim that the King James Version translators would have been completely on his side in the debate. The evidence we've examined up to this point makes James' claim look um, highly historically uninformed. We are now going to continue our examination of the translators to the reader and see what we can learn from it about the LXX, the Latin Vulgate, and the scholarly qualifications which are desirable for work with the biblical text. We will discover that the evidence against James White's claim will grow even higher. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are a great God. Thank you for giving us your word through Christ, the final prophet, your, uh, the eternal word of God, and for his giving it to us by the Spirit through holy men of God. We pray that we would reverence, bow low before it, humble ourselves before every word of your truth, and that we would love it and defend it, be willing to lay down our lives for it, and that this review video would strengthen uh, true believers that watch it in their faith and in the inspiration and preservation of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, what the preface to the King James Version says about the LXX fits exactly with what um, I said about the LXX in the debate, as we're going to see in just a second, and what the King James preface says about the LXX exactly contradicts what Brother White said about it. But recall that White said in our debate uh, that he believes firmly that the King James translators would be completely on his side in the debate today, and they would never adopt the perspective that was advocated uh, by me for perfect inspiration, verbal plenary inspiration and preservation. So that's what James White said. They'd be completely on his side. He's very firmly, very firmly convinced of that. But what does the KJV preface say about the LXX that relates to our debate topic? Now, let me first point out that the KJV uh, preface argues from uh, apostolic practice for not altering or amending even translations that have serious issues. So in other words, according to the KJV translators, if we grant White's argument that modern translators know more about Hebrew Greek words for various flowers and rocks than did the King James translators, the conclusion that we should give up the KJV for the LSB would not actually follow. So what did they say? They said, uh, it is certain that, that that translation, the LXX, was not so sound and so perfect, but that it needed in many places correction. And who had been so sufficient for this work as the apostles or apostolic men? Yet it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to them to take that which they found, the same being for the greatest part true and sufficient, rather than by making a new, in that new world and green age of the church, to expose themselves to many exceptions and cavillations, as though they made a translation to serve their own turn, and therefore bearing witness to themselves, their witness not to be regarded. This may be supposed to be some cause why the translation of the 70, the LXX, was allowed to pass for current. So even if, for the sake of argument, we grant that in a verse here or there, the rendering of the KJV is archaic or could be stated better, nonetheless, according to the KJV preface, supported by the examples of the Holy Ghost and the apostles, we should still retain the commonly used English translation. Things would need to get much worse with the KJV than Brother White even attempted to prove in our debate before we would be justified in replacing the KJV according to the preface. Before pointing out the next thing that the KJV preface says about the LXX, let me remind you of something quite important that came up in our debate. James argued around two hours and two minutes into the debate video that the New Testament rejects the testimony of the Hebrew text in passages such as Hebrews 8, 9 and Hebrews 10, 5 to follow the LXX 
against the Hebrew text. I was delighted when James brought these passages up because his position that all the Hebrew manuscripts are wrong is unscriptural. It violates Christ's promise in Matthew 5.18. And White's position is also, I trust unintentionally, but it is an attack on the inerrancy of scripture. And it's an attack on the preservation of scripture. James thinks true readings can vanish from the Hebrew text. So the first three-fourths of the Bible, at least, according to uh, Brother James, uh, have not been perfectly preserved by God. And his view greatly hinders apologetics because he has to say in a variety of places, the true words of God have been lost from the original language text. And this also actually shows his argument from Hebrews 8, 9, to Hebrews 10, 5, shows why he cannot consistently make his often repeated arguments against the King James in 1 John 5, 7 and Revelation 16, 5. And we'll look at those passages later in a later review video, Lord willing. Now, not only does James White think the Old Testament has been corrupted in those texts quoted in Hebrews 8, 9 and Hebrews 10, 5, but he defended the LSV's reading in Judges 16, 13 and in 1 Samuel 13, 1, where the LSV rejects 100% of Hebrew manuscripts. So I believe it was an answer to prayer when um, James brought up his unscriptural argument on Hebrews 8, 9 and Hebrews 10, 5. As um, we had prepared quite a few slides ahead of time to deal with exactly this argument uh, that he would make to attack preservation. The sort of argument that uh, Brother White makes here is one that was discussed in the King James Only Baptist seminaries that I went to um, quite a long time ago now. And James is not making a new argument here. It's And the response that I made to his argument is what has been the standard response of Christian orthodoxy since at least the times of the Puritan John Owen in the 1600s, the opponents of biblical preservation who were his contemporaries. And furthermore, James White had made exactly the same argument when debating Douglas Wilson. And Wilson's uh, answer, which is that there's some canonical readings that are not original readings, is highly unsatisfactory. And so that response by Douglas Wilson was just as pernicious to the word of God as his White's argument. Now, in light of all this, it was interesting to see James say, okay, got you, sorry, in our second cross-examination, as if he was about to wipe the floor with me by making an argument that I was totally unprepared for and for which there was no answer, when I actually had 18 slides on this very argument pre-prepared uh, covering the very passages that James White brought up and was praying and hoping that he would bring up this topic in the debate. So God is very good, and we praise the Lord for that. Now, the allegation that James makes that New Testament quotations of the LXX um, are made even when the LXX mistranslates the Hebrew, that is an important enough allegation that I want to make it a separate debate review video. And I intend to do that, Lord willing, when I get to reviewing that portion of the debate. My point in bringing it up now is that the King James Version translators and the preface to the King James take exactly the same position as I did and specifically repudiate what White argued. They said that the apostles had the Hebrew text as their final authority and rejected the LXX to follow the Hebrew whenever the two differed. So how does this fit? with the, this fact, plain fact, fit with Brother White's astonishing claim that the King James translators would be completely on his side in our debate based on the King James preface. Well, let's take a look at the actual statements in the preface here. So the King James translator said, the translation of the 70, the LXX, descendeth from the original in many places, neither doth it come near it, for perspicuity, purpose, blah, perspicuity. There we go. Perspicuity, gravity, clarity means clarity, of course. Perspicuity, gravity, majesty. Yet which of the apostles did condemn it? Condemn it? Nay, they used it, as it is apparent, and as Saint Jerome and most learned men do confess, which they would not have done, nor by their example of using it so grace and commend it to the church, if it had been unworthy the appellation and name of the Word of God. They. The LXX translators did many things well, as learned men. But yet as men, they stumbled and fell, one while through oversight, another while through ignorance. Yea, sometimes they may be noted to add to the original, and sometimes to take from it, which made the apostles 
to leave them many times when they left the Hebrew and to deliver the sense thereof according to the truth of the word, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This may suffice touching the Greek translations of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Is there any reason to deny that the apostles used the LXX when it was accurate? There's no reason to believe, uh, to deny that for believers in perfect preservation. So if you can believe in perfect preservation, you can believe that the, that the apostles used the LXX when it was an accurate translation. Now, if I were an evangelist or a missionary in a country that only had a translation of questionable accuracy today, in some places or even in far too many places, I would also use that less than super translation, at least until improvements could be made. But know that the King James translators took the same position as I take on this issue. So they recognized that the apostles could have quoted the LXX when it was an accurate translation of the Hebrew. But whenever the LXX differed from the Hebrew, Hebrew was always the authority. Sounds like Matthew 5.18, doesn't it? So that is what scripture teaches, and it is what the King James translators believed as documented in the preface. And it is what I argued for in the debate, while well, White argued for exactly the opposite. And by thinking that he had a gotcha moment in the debate here, gave good reason to question whether Brother James has ever seriously grappled with a case against what he's arguing for, despite having a book on this subject out for you know several decades now. Now, the comments by what the King James translators also said in the Latin Vulgate and on Jerome, its translator, also supports the position I argued for in the debate and disagrees with James' position. So what did the preface say? There were also, within a few hundred years after Christ, translations many into the Latin tongue. For this tongue also was very fit to convey the law and the gospel by. Because in those times, very many countries of the West, yea, of the South and East and North, spake or understood the Latin, being made provinces to the Romans. But now, the Latin translations were too many to be all good, for they were infinite. Latini interpretis nulla mora numerari possent, saith St. Augustine. Again, they were not out of the Hebrew fountain. We speak of the Latin translations of the Old Testament, but out of the Greek stream. Therefore, the Greek being not altogether clear, the Latin derived from it must needs be muddy. This moves St. Jerome, a most learned father, and the best linguist without controversy of his age, or of any that went before him, to undertake the translating of the Old Testament out of the very fountains themselves, which he performed with that evidence of great learning, judgment, industry, and faithfulness, that he hath forever bound the church unto him in a debt of special remembrance and thankfulness. So note that the King James translator said that vernacular translations were too many to be all good for they were infinite. Does that not sound exactly like the situation today with modern English Bible versions? Are there not more, far more modern English Bible versions today than there were Latin translations in Augustine's day? So exactly what James White is defending with the uh, superabundance of modern versions is condemned by the King James translators. According to the King James translators, it is possible to have translations too many in one language. Now, of course, this also fits perfectly with their expressed intention for the version to be the church Bible, the only Bible used in church, and the Bible which would supersede all others in English as the best English version, as we saw in earlier review videos. Note as well that the King James Version translators refer to Jerome as the best linguist without controversy of his age or of any that went before him. The King James Version translators, as James White himself noted in his King James Only Controversy, and as you pointed out earlier, said that the KJV translators were some of the finest scholars the world has ever seen, and no one can possibly dispute this. They were, as Bart Ehrman recognized, serious, serious scholars and the best of the best. And as Dr. Leland Riken pointed out, the King James Version is demonstrably the greatest English Bible ever. 
Let me all add to these testimonies concerning the historically clear facts that the KJV translators were some of the greatest scholars the world has ever seen, the facts that the editors of the Greek text Receptus were great scholars as well. So uh, Erasmus. Erasmus is frequently characterized as the greatest scholar of the age, as the greatest classical scholar of the Northern Renaissance and the foremost advocate of reform on the eve of the Reformation, and further statements just like that. Uh, Theodore Beza, uh, Text Receptus editor Theodore Beza, was perhaps the best Bible scholar of the day in Europe. Theodore Beza was one of the most learned scholars of his day, and he was also the last of the reformers, living more than a quarter of a century after the others had passed away. If Erasmus, the famous scholar who published the New Testament in Greek, may be said to have begun the Reformation, Beza, who is a great scholar, also published the New Testament, may be said to have closed it. Now, no one is making such claims for the translators of the LSB that they're the most learned scholars of the age. <laughs> okay, so the editors of the Nestle Allen text as well are certainly educated opponents of the inspiration of scripture, but they're simply not the greatest scholars alive. So the KJV referring to Bible translation as being appropriately done by the greatest scholars of their age fits the model found in the KJV itself, but does not fit the model that gave us the LSB. Note as well that the King James translators were thankful for the Latin Vulgate in the quotation that we put up from them already. And the Latin Vulgate is considerably closer to the Textus Receptus than it is to the modern Nestle Allen text. That's the fact, inaccurate claims by the Seventh-day Adventist cultist Benjamin Wilkinson to the contrary notwithstanding. So the Latin Vulgate has the resurrection appearances in Mark 16, 9 to 20, just like the Textus Receptus in the KJV. And unlike the Nestle Allen Textus Rejectus, the Latin Vulgate includes the woman taken in adultery in John 7, 53 to 8, 11. The Latin Vulgate contains Acts 8, 37 and 1 John 5, 7. Uh, you can see the Douay Rheims translation of the Vulgate. For example, if you can't read Latin, the Douay Rheims is translated from Latin. So if you look there, you can see that it has these readings. So as um, Houghton Standard Introduction, the Latin New Testament, published by Oxford University Press, says, the Vulgate is closer to the latter standard Koine or Byzantine text. It was once thought that Jerome's Greek text was similar to Codice Sinaiticus of Vaticanus, but this is no longer the case. So if we agree with the King James Version's translators' assessment of the Vulgate, their positive assessment of the Latin Vulgate, then the King James is superior to the LSB because the King James is much closer, the, the Vulgate is a T basically a Byzantine type text, which is much closer to the King James than it is to the LSB. So what have we learned then in this review video? Well, we've learned that the view of the King James translators about the Greek LXX or Septuagint was exactly the same as the KJV only confessional bibliology position on the LXX that I advocated when debating James White. Furthermore, what the translators to the reader says about the Latin Vulgate and about the qualifications for doing textual and translational work strongly supports the superiority of the KJV and its underlying language text and to modern versions like the LSB and their underlying language texts. The document James White cites as evidence that the KJV translators would be completely on his side in our debate, which Brother White says uh, proves very, very firmly that his position is correct, actually disagrees with what he says 100% on issues like the LXX and agrees with what I argued 100%. Oops. In our next debate review video, we will look at what the translators to the reader indicates about how the King James Version compares to other English versions. We will see that the actual evidence is that the King James Version translators viewed the KJV as superior to all other English versions, then extant, and believing their argument necessitates the superiority of the KJV to modern English versions based on the corrupt Nestle Allen text. So thank you for watching. May the God of all grace, by his word and spirit, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you.
To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.